welcome. My name is Sonia Gavan Karmake, and today we get to speak with AX3 Commander Michael Lopez Alegria, who is currently aboard the International Space Station on his sixth mission to space. Commander, we see you in the cupola. What an amazing view! Here yeah, I yeah. am. It's a great place to hang out. Well, we're lucky to be hanging out with you. I have a room full of people who have jammed ourselves into the cupola here with you. I'm excited to ask you some questions. <laughs> <laughs> During your time on mission, have you been able to look out onto the Earth and see any specific spots? Yeah, of course. You know, looking out the window is what we do in our free time. We don't have a ton of free time, but we, we managed to get enough window time. And I would say we've been focusing mostly on Europe, not surprisingly, um, Spain, Turkey, Sweden, Italy. Luckily, except for Sweden, we get a lot of those in the same past, certainly Spain and Italy. Sweden's a little tough because we don't get up that high latitude-wise, so we have to kind of look at it obliquely and the weather's not been great. But, you know, it's it's great to see the Earth no matter what part of it. Well, the cupola has become a defining feature of the International Space Station. Do you build in time to go there uh, for things other than Earth observing or or it's just catch as catch can? Well, we have um, some personal time blocked out on our schedule. I wouldn't say every day, but some days. And so that's that's a popular destination. Let's put it that way. Um, often when you come here, there's already somebody in the window day or night. Nighttime is viewing is pretty spectacular when the weather is nice. You can figure out where you are just by the pattern of, this, of the light, city lights, which is uh, it's kind of like a little geography test, and you get better and better the longer you've been up here. Well, Commander, we are grateful to spend some time with you. We have a bunch of our team members who have been following the mission, of course, but they've also been building the Axiom Station, and they have some questions for you as well as some school kids. Are you up for that? More than up for that. Let's do it. Okay, so we're going to ask each of our team members here at Axiom Space to introduce yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Howdy, LA. Uh, James Mahoney from the Structures and Mechanism team here on Station Side, uh, working all things Windows uh, as well as for our Earth Observatory module. Uh, wondering, based on your experience with the full size mo full size mock up that we have here at the Space Station Development Facility, how do you think the experience will be for future crews looking outside of the uh, Axiom Earth Observatory module? It's almost hard for me to imagine what that would be like. I mean, it's such a, a pleasure and a privilege to get into this little space. And, you know, comparing it to the size of the Earth Observatory, it's um, it's Mighty Mouse compared to Superman. I mean, it's really, it's really going to be an amazingly immersive, completely enveloping experience. I can't wait to do it. That's great. You know, uh, our next team member is coming up to the stage here. Uh, this background almost looks like something that uh, you put into a, a remote meeting. So, like, it's hard to even imagine that we're talking to you in space. Kelly from our AXEMU team is here for our next question. Hi, Commander. My name is Kelly Reed. I am part of the team here at Axiom Space that is developing the next generation spacesuit, the Axiom U. My question for you is, do you remember your very first EVA and what was that like for you? Hey, Kelly. Yeah, I do remember my first EVA. Um, it was interestingly out of the shuttle airlock. So today, when people do spacewalks out of the space station airlock, the hatch looks straight down at the earth. So it's just a round thing. You open the hatch and you're looking straight down five miles a second going beneath your feet, you know, 250 miles away. It's pretty eye-watering. But when I did it, it was in the payload bay. So the airlock opened into sort of the half crescent of the payload bay. It's kind of like a, a cocoon. And so you're generally, you don't see that um, sight quite so quickly so i think it gives you a little more time to adapt and obviously it looks a lot looks and feels a lot like uh, the, the swimming pool the neutral buoyancy lab that we trained for so long and so it felt very much uh comfortable i would say it's not like the guys who do their their evas today their first evas out of the station airlock which i would imagine when you open that hatch and you see out the window there or out the the open hatchway, it's a, it's a bit of a white knuckle moment. Hi, I'm Mayur Bakta and I'm with the operations team. I was curious to hear your thoughts on the sweet spot when it comes to mission duration. 
You've been on short duration missions like the current 14 day dock mission and longer six month to one year long missions. Which do you prefer? And can you speak a little bit to the benefits of each? Well, you're a good question. Um, you know, I think there's a, a role for both kinds of missions and people have often used the analogy of a sprint and a marathon for a short duration and a six month mission respectively. And I think that's a pretty good analogy. Um, it's all a question of mindset. You know, you can't start out running a sprint and then expect to run 26 miles and, and nor would you do very well in a sprint if you started out at a marathoner's pace. So you've got to kind of know what's coming. And I think you can adjust um, as a as the astronaut, as a crew member pretty well. In terms of the return on the science, also good for both. I mean, you like to know the long duration effects and obviously the longer you're up here, the, the better you can study that. Uh, but on the other hand, the more the shorter the mission duration the more uh, frequently we can send astronauts so in summary i think there's a, a role for both short and long duration missions in human spaceflight hi commander i'm andrew klinsky with the crew systems team and i'm working on the interior design of our hub what kinds of lighting controls do you like on the iss and what additional controls would you like to have Andrew, we uh, we definitely have a lot to talk about when it comes to interior design. I've been up here on the International Space Station taking notes about how we can improve things for the Axiom Station. But as regards lighting, we go around the planet, you know, 16 times a day, which means 16 sunrises and sunsets, which means we couldn't live by the normal day-night cycle or we wouldn't get anything done. Um, so we have lighting that we use during the day and then we shut it off at night. And I, when I say day and night, I mean our wake period, our sleep period. And one thing that I really like that they've incorporated on the ISS since my expedition mission is the tu tunable lights. Actually, they have three frequencies. So a general frequency for normal uh, operations during the day. But in the morning, you have a very bright, uh, wider light that helps wake you up more and can also help prepare you for sleep shift. If you have to wake up earlier than normal one day, it can really start shifting your circadian rhythm, rhythm in the right direction. The same goes for the third setting, which is more of a reddish light, which we use in pre-sleep as we're getting ready to wind down for bed. So I think those are things, tunable light is something we should definitely incorporate on the Axiom station. Hello, I'm Kevin Ogden, and I'm also with the Axiom space team. I'm curious what your crew quarters are like on this mission and what you think would be useful additions to the Axiom Space crew quarters. Well, Kevin, uh, sleep quarters are obviously very important, um, not only to provide a good place for you to sleep, but also some privacy. I mean, I think the psychological impact of, of that kind of a, an arrangement is really important. Uh, here on ISS, we have four regular crew quarters on the USOS plus one extra one called CASA, the acronym for something in the uh, European lab european module um, that can accommodate a, a fifth person should there be one up here and then there are three kayudas or sleep stations on the russian segment so if you add that up at seven plus maybe one eight and we're 11 people up here so at least three of us have to camp out so we basically just roll out roll out a sleeping bag at night and we roll it up uh, in the morning after our sleep period is over uh, on this mission um Walter is sleeping in Dragon, Alper is sleeping in the Japanese experiment module, and I'm in the airlock, while Marcus gets the luxury of sleeping in the European module since he's representing ESA and that's their contribution. So he gets a little bit cushier um, accommodations than we do. Hello, my name is Ariel Richards. I'm with the station program side as well. I'm interested to know, this being your sixth spaceflight mission, how have you seen the International Space Station evolve and what further evolutions do you imagine for Axiom Station? Thanks for the question, Ariel. Uh, it certainly has changed quite a bit since uh, my first visit back in 2000. In fact, on that mission, I was the last person out of an unmanned ISS. In other words, the Expedition 1 crew launched a, a couple of days after we landed and docked to the ISS. And of course, it's been inhabited ever since. So since then, of course, Expedition 14, we had a few more modules. It was um, basically ended at the lab, the USOS did. And then of course, now it has a second node. It has uh, Columbus, GEM, Node 3, uh, PMM, 
uh, in the cupola, which is a nice addition that I got to witness for the first time on AX1 and where I'm talking from you now, talking to you from now. Uh, finally, it's pretty interesting that when the a Axiom station, the AX HAB modules get on board, it'll be like a new wing of the station. So it just keeps growing and evolving over time. It's pretty exciting to be part of. LA, now we have some very special questions from our favorite kids here at Axiom Space. Matthew, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Matthew Ramsey and I'm 12 years old. Do you feel like you're on top of the world? And how does that feel? Hey, Matthew. Yeah, it kind of does feel like you're sitting on top of the world. I mean, in fact, there is a world, right? So I'm, uh, I'm most definitely on top of it. I think you know we're about 400 kilometers, 250 miles up, and we're traveling around it, the world at uh, a rate of 17,000, a little more per hour, miles per hour, about 28,000 kilometers, which breaks down to five miles per second, which is pretty darn fast. And that means we go around the earth every 90 minutes. So you get a beautiful view of um, the whole planet. And uh, of course the earth rotates underneath us as we're going around it. So we see a different swath each time. And uh, it's, it's pretty spectacular. Hi, my name is Grace. I'm 11 years old. And do you ever feel like you're gonna fall in space? Hey Grace, um, no, we really don't feel like we're falling. It's just like floating. So it's, it's kind of like being in a swimming pool. Um, obviously there's no water and you don't have to come up for air. We can breathe uh, the air that's around us clearly, but um, it's, it's really like floating. You don't feel that sensation of falling, but it's a good question because a lot of people think there's no gravity up here. There's actually about the same amount of gravity here as there is on earth. The difference is that we're falling around the earth because we're going so fast. And so think of being in an elevator, the cable breaks, elevator starts crashing toward the ground. You are going to be floating in it for a little while. Good news here is that we never get to the bottom of the elevator shaft. We just keep going around and around. Hi, I'm Isla. I'm five years old. How high up are you and how will you get back home? Hey, Isla, as I mentioned, uh, about 17,500 miles an hour um, is about how fast we're going. Um, which means we go around the Earth, as I mentioned, every 90 minutes. The, the cool thing is that as we go around the Earth, as I mentioned, you know, it's turning underneath us. And so we go over different territory every day. So you can actually spot the space station from wherever you are um, if it happens to be flying overhead. The, the other thing is it has to be either in the post-sunrise early morning light or the pre-sunset late evening light because that means you're in darkness on the ground but the station is still illuminated by the sun and that makes it look like a bright star moving very quickly across the sky to come home we'll get in our crew dragon and uh, we'll get suited up we'll get strapped in we'll uh, start to maneuver and what that really means is going from that 17,500 ish miles an hour per hour will slow down just a little bit, like just by about 100 or two miles per hour. And that's enough so that it makes the low point of our, or our orbit be in the atmosphere. And of course, as soon as we start hitting the atmosphere, the drag caused by that friction will, will decelerate us. And then we end up landing under parachutes uh, off the coast of Florida, either in the Atlantic or on the Gulf side. Commander, we can't wait to have you back on Earth. And to Walter, Marcus, and Alper, keep up the great work on the rest of the mission and have a safe travel home. From private astronaut missions to developing the next space station and producing spacesuits for use on the moon and in low Earth orbit, this is what we do and how Axiom Space is building for beyond. As we close the final mission update from our space station development facility here in Houston, Texas, stay tuned for the crew's return in the next few days. Until then, go AX3.